as I wrote in my uh, email, I want to address directly some issues that come up at uh, gatherings of family and friends, especially this year. Uh, the things I talked about last week, which actually are the, the substratum of our trying to manage conversations, which is the idea that the voice of truth of God is in exile in Egypt, in exile in each of us. So if you were interested in my talk last week, it's now in a written form in my Shabbat thought. But I want to talk a little bit about the nature of our gatherings. So before you go to a Seder, or before you lead a Seder, I really recommend that everybody take a very deep breath and contemplate what's going on and what you're doing. First of all, every person who is coming has a story. They have their story of their family, their place in their family, uh, their autobiography as a human being. So sometimes when we see people, we don't automatically for a moment and say, this person is a product typically a very complex, of a very complex life, filled with joy and pain and tragedy and hope and fulfillment and disappointment, and they're arriving at your table sitting there, everybody typically freshly scrubbed, and they're looking for something beautiful to happen. But remember, everybody is bringing, in some sense, their own story. One thing we focus on at Passover is the story. Uh, now, as far as the Seder, what are people looking forward to? I have to remind myself of this all the time. No matter how much I study the Haggadah, and I see the Haggadah as a beautiful, artistic, musical score, for most people, it's a little bit of the story, a little bit of the rituals, convivial conversation, maybe some songs afterwards. And they don't want uh, many, mo most people don't want the so-called religious ritual part overdone. So just remind you one thing that I've, almost always done since I was a rabbinical student, was ask the people there to say, how long do you want us to go? And typically people say somewhere around 25, 30, 35 minutes. I said, okay, so right now it's this hour, and I promise we'll stop at this hour and do the matzah and so forth and move forward. So that actually uh, reduces, uh, because of cognitive dissonance, if people agree to go for 25, 30 minutes, they will go to 25 or 30 minutes. And that's what I think we have to plan to do, is how to get through the most essential rituals, let's say the, 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 four, the, the four questions, uh, the four archetypes of children, uh, telling the story, to get to where we need to go at the time. Now, one thing that I recommend, nearly everybody cuts out the, the, the long middle part of the Seder, except for the plagues and the Dayenu. But that actually is the rabbinic elaboration of telling the story. So we really should tell the story. So I recommend that everybody read the book of Exodus from chapter 1 through chapter 14, get a sense of the story, and then collectively ask, what do we all remember about this story? It's a nice way to have the story told. How did we get into Egypt? What happened when we got into Egypt? Why did Pharaoh want to kill all the firstborn sons? So... And, and it'll be surprising how many people remember from Sunday school or Hebrew school or watching movies, the story. So I think it's very important to uh, get the story told and also to use imagination, as our poem does, to, to recall that this story has been told ever since biblical times. So we're sitting here in 2024 well, 25, 2,600 years ago, maybe even up to 3,000 years ago, this story was told in one way or another. It's a very deep and profound thing that we're taking our part in this chain of tradition that goes back uh, to the, to the, to the be beginning of our, our biblical times from the Exodus from Egypt. Whatever historically happened, and I believe something historical did happen, we kept telling the story. One thing that we uh, do at our seders is before the seder begins, we go outside and look at the full moon. I or someone else uh, leads a little meditation. We're looking at the same moon that people have looked at for 2,500, 3,000 years on this very night. It's always a full moon. And one thing I try to imagine is, as we look at the moon, all those who sat at seders for all these generations also looked at the moon and since they're looking back down at us. 
It's a very holy, deep moment. So people are coming for the story. They're coming for the rituals. And unfortunately, the first thing I mentioned, that people are coming with family stories, family acrimony, family conflict, uh, conflict between siblings, with cousins, parents and children, uh, all are important to the evening. And sometimes it takes the slightest little trigger for a family event to unravel. Um, I'm, I'm going to tell you one of the first times I heard about this as a rabbinical student. I was talking to someone, and um, I, I said, so who's coming? And he, meant, he mentioned to me, oh, I'm not allowed to talk to my cousins. If my dad knew I talked to my cousins, he would uh, disown me. I, I said, what happened? He says, well, my, my dad and his brother are not talking, and they both told their children that they can't talk to each other. So basically, until our dads pass away, we can't talk to each other. I said, what happened? He said, a Passover Seder in 1980. I said, what happened at a Passover Seder in 1980? He says, well, uh, you know, my family is a lifelong Democrats, but my, my dad's brother voted for Reagan, so-called Reagan Democrat, and they got into a bitter shouting argument, things that were said that should have never have been said. It was very uncomfortable. Everybody was very disturbed. Somebody stormed out, I'm not sure who it was, and they've never spoken since. I'm, I think I'm, I'm telling this story uh, uh, in the early 2000s, so it's, it's been a good 20 years, enough for the, the cousins to be affected by this. Now, that's not the last time I've heard of that, uh, that um, people come in to, to settle scores. People come in to be passive-aggressive. People go, sometimes consciously, usually not consciously. They come in ready for a put-down, ready to keep a difficult conversation going. That's normal at family gatherings. Unfortunately, the person hosting the gathering is not oftentimes not quick-witted enough to put those fires out right away. So I want to say to each of you, and I mean this very deeply, seriously. If you're leading a Seder, remember that you have the responsibility to make sure things that go well. And sometimes when you're leading the Seder, other people feel like they are students in a classroom. And students in the classroom get, uh, feel free to act out. And the moral authority in the room, which is oftentimes the host, the guest, they actually have an implicit responsibility that people be treated civilly. And I want to say that again, and I want to say it strongly. If you are a host or leading a Seder, you have an implicit responsibility that the people at your table in your home are treated civilly. And if someone breaks that code, you have to have a script ready. Don't wait for it to happen and for you to fumble with your words and you're not sure how to exert moral authority. I'm taking this book from, the, from teaching rabbinical students about rabbis presiding. As much as we want to preside and bring joy and information into the setting, one always has to be prepared when someone goes rogue, when someone is not acting according to the code of honor, and you have to think of a way in a kind, firm, gentle way to get things back. Now, there's all kinds of things you can say. Um, uh, you know, sometimes you can say, well, let's all take a deep breath. I'm really sorry that these negative feelings have arisen here. Let's all just try to get back to telling stories. Something to acknowledge. You can't ignore things that happen. You can take a deep breath and say, um, Let's not work that out here. Let's all calm down and bring it back. So you'll have to devise your own way. What I'm saying is be prepared. Uh, now, the next thing I want to say has to do with not only with uh, Reagan Democrats and everything else that's usually going on, and some, you know, there's been my entire life as an American, there's always been uh, a controversy, and I've been at a few very unpleasant uh, satyrs and where the person leading was not prepared to to affirm the moral order when people are gathered together, the moral order of civility. And I've sometimes been in the role where, I, where I'm the one that has to say, let's not do this here. Uh, let's not argue. Understand everybody has a strongly felt point of view, and we're going to get back to the Seder. So this year, we're in a, we're in a particularly difficult uh, uh, position because of what's going on in Israel and what's going on at the campuses. And uh, I'll share quite frankly with you I think that one thing that is happening at apparently mostly the elite universities, but other places, 
there's a new kind of quasi-religion that has taken hold. It's the quasi-religion of anti, I call it the aunties, the aunties, the anti-colonialism, uh, anti-imperialism, anti-capitalism, all of this projected onto the state of Israel, which is the scapegoat, which means the Palestinians are the archetypal victims, Israelis are the archetypal oppressors, it fits into a narrative. Um, young people are oftentimes indoctrinated by this with no capacity to resist by professors who have joined what I'll call this quasi-religion. It becomes their, the meaning in life becomes their belief system. There may be coming, people coming to your Seder that all they, the, the only news information they have is social media. I'm astonished when people say to me, I get my news from Instagram. I did not know that that was a thing, uh, but it's a thing. And depending on their feed, that's how they get the news. So be prepared. Somebody at your table may be an unwitting a participant in this quasi-religion, I'll, I'll call it a religion of resentment and victimhood, etc., with Israel as the source of more or less all evil in the world today, if one were to believe what Hamas and others say. And then other people are simply uh, uninformed, and people might say things uh, that are very, very disturbing to you or to your other guests. Now, this is a, is a very, very difficult moment, and again, you have to be prepared. Uh, now, first of all, I, here's what I recommend. If somebody says something outrageous, you know, we're ignoring the genocide in Gaza. We're ignoring the Israeli occupation. We're not discussing about how America supports a fascist regime. If somebody says something like this, my strongest recommendation is for someone to say, I'm going to ask that nobody respond. Let's all just take a deep breath, because somebody's going to want to respond, and those kinds of arguments can, can again, become volatile, meaning scars remain in a family, uh, for, in one case, for a couple of decades, and sometimes people walk away very wounded, very upset, because they didn't feel that a moral authority, uh, a moral authority establishing the civility required for a family gathering was there. So you have to be prepared, and the main thing I recommend is do not let an argument break out. So somebody says something, you, uh, you uh, as a participant, if you feel that you can pull this off, or as, a, uh, as a, the host or, or the Seder leader, you can say, well, so I'll take a deep breath, and I'd like us, no one here in the room to respond. Okay? Then, if you want to, you can look at the person who said genocide, Gaza-free, uh, Israeli, to say, I, I want to share with you personally, that that's not what we're doing tonight. If we want to discuss politics, let's finish the Seder. Somebody can go in the backyard, and if you want to, and I hope you're civil, and I hope you're informed, and I hope you have wisdom and knowledge, but I'm asking that we not do it at this table. Secondly, the language that you use I found personally hurtful. Personally hurtful. So I'm going to stop here, and we're going to continue this later. So what you need to do is nobody respond, nobody argue, remind people that's not why we've gathered to have political arguments, and say, I have been personally offended by the language you're using, but we can talk about this later. Stop it right there. Remember, you have people coming home from college campuses who are swept up in this and they're aching to use the Seder as the forum to, as it were, spread this quasi-religion and enlighten everybody in the room and bring everybody to proper faith. And sometimes it is, it, it, I, I've seen it. Uh, I remember one father told me he was estranged from his son. His you know, dad's a, you know, a, a businessman and you know, paying for his kid's school, comes home and basically has a, a socialist screed that his father is an immoral capitalist. And the father blew it. He said, well, who's paying for your education? And, you know, who's paying for these college campuses? And, and they argued back and forth. And I looked at the dad and I said, did you get anywhere? He said, absolutely not. So what was left? Yelling at each other. I said, okay, so now let's take, th think about it. The child says something like that. You take a breath and say, well, I really don't want to argue economic policy here at the table. If you want, we can do it somewhere else, but let's remain civil and make sure our, we have knowledge, not just opinions, and we can act wisely with each other. Um, and here what we're going to do is treat each other civilly and move on with the story. 
Because remember, oftentimes people who have discovered the truth can't wait to share the truth. Now, on the other hand, if as a host you do want to refer to what's happening, you have to refer to it in a very, very careful, sophisticated way. First of all, and again, I'm not sure if we're doing it because we have mostly like-minded people that really don't want to talk about this. We talk about this enough. But if someone mentions it, what I plan to say is it's a terrible, tragic time. Um, first of all, with, with the, the, the slaughter that has been was committed upon our people, a war conducted, and one person said to me, Rabbi Finley, don't you think the war would have been conducted better? I said, I don't know of any war that couldn't have been conducted better. I don't know of any war where the humanitarian aid should not have arrived earlier. I said, if, if that's a real question, let's apply it to every war that's ever happened where one could minimize civilian casualties better and get human, humanitarian uh, uh, care there first. Let's agree that every war has too many people killed and every war has too much suffering. Let's just agree to that, including this war. Is that, I said, is that okay? What disturbs me the most, of course, is um, the, the attacks on Israel that are disproportionate, unfair, and a chilling reminder of anti-Semitism. Now, I don't know if I'm going to use that strong of language, but I can say it's very disturbing. It makes me very sad. Um, we, and as I've said during, during those talks in October, November, December, we have a long struggle ahead of us. We have to be very well armed with information and how to talk to other people. Let's commit ourselves to that. So, if, by the way, if, if you're not up to date on all this, you can look at my YouTube videos from October, November, December. I've put a lot of good information out there, uh, especially just simply how to disarm those arguments. And the main thing you want to come up with when people are distraught about the hatred coming out of the campuses, the hatred from professors, the hatred coming from the UN. Um, and, and again, I think it's unfair, disproportionate, evinces great lack of knowledge. I summarize by saying, we all have a great struggle ahead of us. Let's become informed. It's a long game. And let's commit ourselves uh, to the safety and security of the state of Israel, of the Jewish people, and spreading wisdom, knowledge, goodness throughout the world as much as possible. Uh, uh, a last thing I want to say in the nature of family gatherings, and again, these are things people have reported to me, estrangement that has happened, where somebody did something or said something, and it really was a, a kind of a, a, a zet. Somebody, somebody put somebody down, cut somebody down, did something wrong, and somebody used it, and that what the person tells me is something that is entirely generated, and I'm often talking to a synagogue member or someone in my wisdom work classes, and I say, did you remember wisdom works? Did you remember the four C's and the bad Jedi? Um, uh, Yoshi, if you can put it in the, uh, that my little handout in the chat, that'd be great. If not, I'll make sure it gets there tomorrow. And people say, yeah, I remember you talked about it, but I don't really remember exactly what it was. And that breaks my heart because I've devoted my, really, a, a great deal of my intellectual effort to talking about wisdom in general, becoming people of wisdom, the depths of wisdom, but the beginning of wisdom is virtue, and the beginning of virtue is in our close relationships, our, our, the way we talk with family and friends, spouses, children, cousins, siblings, etc. And a person had, uh, again, one of those, oftentimes it's a cousin or a sibling, just go off on them at a family gathering, pent up rage from something else, and the person didn't remember the no bad Jedi, which means when you have a, when you have a very upset person, no justifying, explaining, defending, not trying to give more information, no defending yourself. You just say, wow, I wasn't really prepared for that. Um, I'm going to think about everything that you've said. Is there anything you want me to do right now? Well, apologize for how you've been. I apologize. Uh, I'm sorry. I liked, I'll get the detail later, but I apologize. You don't know what you're apologizing for. Really, all you're trying to do is calm down, uh, you know, a, an angry person. Okay, so if you're on the receiving side, if you yourself 
feel your upset, your anger, you're wanting to criticize somebody, complain to somebody, use harsh language, I strongly recommend do not do it. And this is where you have to prepare yourself. When you feel any strong negative emotion coming up, veterans will remember this, don't talk. Whatever you do, don't talk. Whatever it is, whatever they've done, don't talk. Take a very deep breath and go to a script. And sometimes the script is... Um, I'm having a tough time right now. I'm, I, I, I'm finding myself upset. Not exactly sure why. So let me just take a minute to, to breathe a little bit. Um, you know, there are times when people have to say, uh, you know, I'm I, I'm really distraught, and I I'm gonna like I'm gonna go out out, out the door for a minute. And I'm gonna come back back in. Please ignore me. The main thing is, don't talk if you feel the urge to criticize, complain, condemn, or engage in escalating conflict. Now, other people will, will see this, and they'll say, what's happening? Say, you know what? It's all, again, you're not being completely honest, but you can say, hey, it's all my stuff. Please ignore it. Let's move on. Now, I, I hope all of you who have no idea what I'm talking about don't mind my talking about it. But from where I sit, I've heard of Thanksgiving dinners, Christmas dinners, Passover seders, Rosh Hashanah lunches, Yom Kippur break the fast that have completely come apart because people didn't remember, don't defend yourself to a hostile person. Just say, wow, I don't understand. Let me think about everything you're saying. Or regulate if you're the one that's upset. If you remember those two things, if you've ever seen this anywhere, just remember if everybody knew those two things, don't be defensive to a hostile person, have a disengagement script at hand. And if you find yourself filled with hostile energy, don't talk, take a breath, go to some kind of disengagement uh, script, and then try to move back in. So uh, we've gone to the uh, sublime down to the mundane, and I wouldn't be saying this unless I feared for all of us, especially during these times, that our family gatherings can, uh, can come apart in painful ways, and you as a leader, host, or participant, you might have the wherewithal to calm things down and have people receive what they came for, for, which is the closeness of family and friends, to engage in an ancient tradition that connects us to the past and to the future, uh, a beautiful story of human liberation, fun food, fun songs, and the, we, we ought to leave people with a, you know, a glow of a wonderful Seder, and, and you be the one that's responsible to work toward that 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 wonderful glow, and uh, as opposed to a a, a a a fire breaking out at your seder. All right, I will take any comments or questions about this uh, homespun advice that I mean deeply and sincerely. I hope it doesn't apply to you, but if it does, uh, you'll be thankful that you had your skills ready to go. <laughs>